So, hi. Thanks for um, having me. Um, thanks for listening. Um, also, I just want to throw it out there that um, <clears throat> I'm pretty informal, so if you have a question, feel free to interrupt me. Um, or if, like, you want to talk about something, just speak up. Um, or if you don't, I could, either way, I can just talk straight through them and can do questions at the end. Um, but... I guess that's what I have to say. Or my computer's just slow. Sorry. Okay, there we go. <laughs> so I'm just going to start um, with my background. Um, these are my parents. Um, and like this photograph, just like for me, what I love about photography is um, finding family photographs, um, documenting life for yourself it's kind of like a, a personal diary photography instagram like every like photography in general um so that's really what got me interested in photography um <clears throat> and just to give you a little bit of background of where i grew up where i was born i was born in annapolis maryland but my parents uh grew up in colorado and they met in colorado so i grew up in colorado um and um, actually, um, so I grew up in white suburbia, Colorado. So Fort Collins, Colorado. It's about an hour uh, north of Denver. So it's actually closer to Wyoming than it is to Denver, just by like 15 minutes. Um, <clears throat> so I grew up in white suburbia and definitely, and I was homeschooled till seventh grade. So um, I definitely felt kind of isolated and um, growing up, I was very quiet. Um, my high school essay was about me being reticent, not talking unless I had to, unless someone asked me a question. Um, I was like almost mute, but like not mute complete, like completely. Um, and then um, I was just, once I could apply to colleges and start thinking about college, I was so excited to just leave Colorado and just go to the East Coast where there was more diversity. There we go. Um, <clears throat> so I went to Rochester Institute of Technology and um, there in arts and photo school, I was still um, kind of the only black person, not the only, but very few black people, probably like three people in the whole program that I would run into. <laughs> so just like my life has, I've always been, um, you know, like the outcast or just like felt like I didn't belong. Um, so at RIT, I actually switched my major three times. Um, so I, I like to do, I'm very like, I try my best to stay true to myself instead of what everyone else is doing. So, um, and I knew I wanted to do photography. I've been doing it since seventh grade. Um, so at first I went to RIT thinking I was gonna be a photojournalist. Um, and then as I was learning more and more and do shooting events, I realized I didn't like events. Um, so I switched my major to advertising. And one reason I switched my major to advertising because I wasn't comfortable with lighting. I, um, especially using flash and strobes, um, natural lighting of course is um, a given. So like um, I really wanted to perfect my lighting skills. And, um, and then as assignments went on, I realized that <clears throat> I didn't like selling things, um, um, products. Um, so I switched my major to fine art and, um, in fine art, I'm also in general, like a thinker and I'm kind of always in my head. Um, but, um, at RIT, just with my experience and just being on the East coast, there is a lot more black people, you know, but they weren't in RIT, but just in, locally in Rochester. So I started a project photographing these high school students. So I had to write a proposal to the city, um, <clears throat> the city school district, the principal of the school, and I think one other 
person or um, um, I, I had one more letter I had to write. I can't remember who it was to, but I had to get approval to photograph these students because they're minors. Um, so I got um, permission. It took five weeks too. So I also had to think ahead of time before school started and um, <clears throat> um, just give myself five in relation to classes and whatever, just give myself five weeks to allow that permission to go through. So I didn't get permission during class in session. Um, I got permission after school, their after school programs. So um, a lot of students stayed for tutoring, clubs, sports, um, and I was allowed access to ask students to photograph them. And then I also had model releases with me in um, I got permission from their parents to photograph them. So I gave, I asked the student to take their picture. I took their picture and gave them the model release and they took it home and then I would um, find them and they would give it back. Um, so this is just, and it's titled resemblance because um, we, like I, I relate, I, I envied these kids because I really wanted to go to school with students who, um, with other, peers that looked like me, other people of color. And so I just envied them. Um, and just um, also I was really awkward. So like, and they're awkward too. So it just like kind of worked for all of us, the awkwardness and um, the lighting and everything. Yeah, Hannah, did you, um, are, is this all natural light or did you light these? These are all natural light. So in the school, um, I think I specifically chose Fuji film. I can't remember if it's food, like right now I all I shoot is Kodak. Um, but like I think I specifically chose Fuji film because it was just a little bit more magenta than Kodak. And so like the fluorescent lights in the school, like that was my strategy because of the fluorescent giving off a of green. And then I would always move the um the students closer to a window or wherever there was natural light. So like here, there was just like a skylight, a uh, natural, um, yeah, window on the ceiling. And um, I just put her um, beneath it. Um, and, and then, and now, sorry, uh, can you just maybe talk a little bit about your process, like working with them, like how, um, you know, cause a, a lot of times students will ask like why, how, how do you like work with a model or like work with your subject? Yeah, um, so I definitely, like, I walk around and then I might see one of these people. And then, like, I kind of approach everyone slowly, um, just like, <laughs> just, just so I don't feel like, hope, I don't want to feel like a predator, like, oh, like, and then just immediately, like, yeah. <laughs> go up to Am them. Ambushing. Yeah, um, so I, um, and I just walk up to them and I just say, hi, I'm, um, my name is Hannah. I don't, I don't go to school here, but I got permission to photograph and was wondering if I could make, take your photo. Um, and then they may ask questions and I'll answer them. And then um, they either say yes or no. Um, but like, uh, in this situation, we were both really quiet. So um, once they said yes, um, I would try to, I owe it, every person I photograph, I try to continue conversation so they're not thinking about what they look like. Um, and it all, it all depends on the person and what I'm, and what I'm going for, but most of the time I'm talking to people while, while I'm multitasking. So like while I'm looking for the light, while I'm looking for where, where to frame, where to place the subject, and how to pose. So it's like, um, I've kind of like just trained myself to look and listen to them at the same time so I can keep up conversation, but also work quickly. Um, so I'm not taking up too much of their time. So um, some of these, like, I'm, I'm on average with strangers with moments like this of like five, 10 minutes of making a portrait. And this one in particular, uh, the um, I don't know if you guys had high schools had Spirit Week, um, so this was Twin Day, and so these are friends dressing up like 
That's fun. Always good. Twins are always so photographically interesting, right? Even if, even if they're yeah. not real twins. Yeah, yeah, they are. Um, so that was undergrad. And then um, when I graduated, um, also my life is just lucky. I mean, like I'm privileged. So like I've been like I went to a good school. I grew up in white suburbia. Like, I, um, so I've had opportunities. Um, but the, I'm just gonna say this just because the last talk I gave, um, I had to explain this. Like, pr I hate the word privilege, even though I use it. Um, and I think a lot of people need to use it today, but I do hate the word because um, even though I'm, I'm privileged, I'm still black. So like, it doesn't mean everything is handed to me. And it doesn't mean that it's written on my forehead and that my life is easy. Um, but it just means that I've had more opportunities than, than most. Um, so after college, I um, had no idea what I was gonna do with my life. Um, but I had a friend who lived in Philadelphia um, and had a spare room. So she offered me to the spare room and it was kind of like a closet, honestly, but I'm grateful, it didn't matter. Um, she offered me the spare room without paying rent until I found a job. So that was like so much better than moving back home to Colorado because I had no idea what I was gonna do after undergrad and I didn't have a job. Um, so my friend, uh, so I moved to Philly in 2009 and coming from white suburbia and mostly being in um, white environments, college, um, my college experience, um, I was really unfamiliar with catcalling and Philadelphia was the largest city that I had ever lived in. Um, but with catcalling, I didn't take it, um, like I definitely, it made me angry for sure. It, I felt violated, um, but I did not reprimand, reprimand the men. My outlook wasn't to teach them anything or discipline them or um, um, I don't know what word I'm looking for. So <laughs> um, my outlook was to change the conversation, to change the power dynamic, because I noticed that it had happened to me frequently throughout the day. And I had to do not just walking the street, going to work, going to the grocery store is it was just it, it was frustrating. And so my way of um, dealing with it was to ask the men to photograph them. And if they said no, I would respect their um, choice and not photograph them. And if they said yes, I we would, and then again, I would talk to them, get to know them, we would learn about each other, you know, um, and then I would, I also, same thing, scanning our, our surroundings to look for the great, better composition, where to place the subject, how to place their shoulder, so, uh, shoulders, <laughs> etc. cetera. Um, so these guys, um, and, and, be and because I, I, um, I just changed the conversation, I became friends with these guys and they started to see me as a photographer instead of a nice piece of ass, you know, so instead of an object. Um, and, and I, like over time, I realized that it was just an expression. It's just like a brush off. You know, like it's just like a just a quick comment, um, 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 but eventually, just like talking to them, the catcalling stopped. Well, it didn't exactly stop. They continued to flirt with me and um, try to go on a date or do whatever. But I would have to be just blatant and be like, "Sorry, I'm not interested in a relationship, but I'm a photographer and I want to take your photo." Um, this guy didn't ask just because of the balcony and it was hard to communicate but I pointed to my camera and he just like naturally did the thing posed and just fell into it and I and I had a bunch of grocery bags with me and also I should say that I'm pretty introverted so like one the pandemic does not bother me I love being alone and being locked down and not having to force myself to go out in society but um 
so every like doing this project the morning i every morning when i would wake up i would just analyze how i felt and if i felt like talking to people or if i was like oh i could talk to people today and then i was like oh i could talk to someone sexually harassing me today <laughs> you know like then i would take my camera with me and I would not provoke anyone. It would just hang on my shoulder. And if once someone catcalled me, then I would ask their permission and yada, yada, yada. Um, and if I wasn't feeling it, I would just leave my camera at home um, because essentially it's about me. And then, um, and then of course I would feel out every situation. Um, if, I, if it didn't feel right, if I felt intimidated, I would not ask them. Um, if, if it felt right and I asked them, but like in the middle of our conversation, it felt weird, then I would like just walk randomly and zigzags to just in case someone was following me home, you know, because these are strangers, you don't know who people actually are. But some of them I definitely came to know over time and we became friends. And also it helped that I had bad luck with apartments, that I lived in West Philly West Philly, or yeah, West Philly, Brewery Town, and then South Philly. So I just like my life in all of these areas. Yeah, so these pictures are definitely for me, I consider them mine. <laughs> this guy I almost missed, like he was talking to me and I was running, looking, I was heading to a to see an apartment that me and my roommate were about to rent. And um, I was running late and I had like grabbed something from CVS and this guy stopped me and like I talked to him for a little bit and then I was like, sorry, I'm running late. And then I was like, oh my God, that's a photograph. And I ran back <laughs> and, then I, and then I stopped him and took a photo. Um, that's awesome, the, the, the opportunity that it's like, the one that got away, but then you, you went back and nabbed it that's great yeah and this guy is like at the time he was like 40 44 i think like so young does not look 44. Yeah. <laughs> um and this like the non-portraiture are just like how i see my not how I see myself but how I want to be approached and this is just like a fantasy of like you know like eventually I want to find love you know or like a partner you know like and have family um so th this is just like like yeah just some brewery town <laughs> but like obviously love doesn't happen the way uh movies and these murals portray love to be. And also I'd have to say, since I grew up in um, white suburbia, like I it was in high school, I had a really hard time dating. Um, and my family is not affectionate. <laughs> we, um, or at the time we weren't like now, um, thankfully now we are affectionate with each other and tell each other that we love each other and now we um support each other emotionally but when i was growing up uh we didn't do that too often so like this project so my parents never told me i was beautiful my brothers never told me i was beautiful or like pretty or never you know felt the need to protect me because i wasn't dating you know <laughs> like and then um yeah so like this also helped me realize that I wasn't ugly, you know, like, um, like these, all the, all of these men being attracted to me, I was like, oh, maybe I am good looking, you know, and then, so these are like, these are my images, you know, this is like a moment in transition in life for me. And this is actually uh, the second photograph I took. Um, his name is Shaq. Um, Cause um, I would, share my information and keep contact. Um, and he, he was down for me to photograph him a second time. So that was the second time you photographed him specifically? Yeah. 
Oh. And I think the title of this one's called like Reshoot. Well, and would you, um, you mentioned you did the, uh, the model releases um, for the, the high school students. Was that something you did with these guys too? No, because um, we're on public property and they're not minors, so. And um, th that's something we haven't really talked about in this class, like model releases and um, mm -hmm. Maybe we won't like totally get into it, but it's like if you're, you know, you're, yeah, you're shooting uh, someone and it, the, the photos might be used for an advertisement or like, you know, some people, some fine artists will, will even do it just to cover their ass just in case like someone sees their own picture in a show and they like don't want it to be there. Some people will do that, but um, I don't think it's like as wide, I don't think it's super widespread, especially in this context. What do you think? Yeah. Are you asking me? Yeah, do you think that's true? Like, like people, at, like in when we were in school, like the people didn't really do that, right? Like, the, yeah, I mean, like now I do it less, but if if it is a child, I definitely do it because that's the law, you know. Yeah. Um, so I always try and follow follow the law, but if the law being on public property, the law doesn't require you to have a model release, but like. So if someone, that's why I always ask um, verbal permission, but also um, I don't do it because if someone did try to sue me, I don't have any money for them to take. And I never made money off of this photograph. So, <laughs> so yeah. it's like, it's more like a, um, yeah. So it's like, even if they did, it, they wouldn't really take anything from me besides like, just expressing themselves that they're unhappy with it. And if they are, I would just not show it. I take it down, you know, like I would, I would just take it out of the project. And I, I would give people my website and stuff and they definitely had my phone number. Um, and I would try to put these on my website while I was making it. Um, And I'll show you, I have it in the slide, we'll see. <laughs> this guy was funny. This is the, this is the before picture. I was walking home, like minding my own business and this guy just like pulls over <laughs> like this. And then I, mean, I just made this picture. Um, yeah, he was really nice. It must be so interesting sort of the the fl we talk a lot in this class about like power dynamics and picture making and how like the camera is sort of this powerful thing and there's always sort of this exchange of power that happens whether it's like intentional or not <clears throat> in photography and it must just be so like just interesting just like the complete flipping of the power dynamic it feels i mean it's a collaboration too right but it's also like a way to reclaim power and it's just so um it's fascinating on a lot of levels i think yeah just like waiting for someone to feel feel righteous feel the righteousness or feel the need to like to express themselves in such a way to a stranger is it's very interesting i mean it's like it's it's learned for sure so that's why i never tried to change anybody because like these are adults and um it i'm not i'm not i like i'm i am an activist but i'm like an artist you know it's like it's not like and people don't appreciate like getting in your face and telling you what to do you know like so like just them experiencing me i would like maybe their experience with me help them understand my perspective of such a manner and maybe, and then of course they forget about it too. Um, and then, yeah. And it, and at the time in 2009, like the typical response was to avoid. So like I was one of very few who would respond to them. Yeah, it must've been so surprising for a lot of them. I feel like, like being taken aback. Yeah.
Um, and this is Hassan. Um, he's one that I de developed a, a friendship relationship over over time. Um, and he was he's a musician, and we walked around, and I made photographs for his his album and whatnot. Um, but it's been over 10 years, so I have lost contact with these guys because I did move, leave Philly, um, and then coming back, it, um, I mean, I think I, I can look up Hassan's email, some of their emails and everything, but um, I just, life happens. It gets busy, you move, life changes, it's like, I barely see my friends, my close friends, my best friend, I probably see once a month. <laughs> like, as you get older, like. Yeah, without, uh, without being in school, I feel like it's just, it's different. It's tougher to stay in touch. Um, yeah. This email. <laughs> <laughs> no, it's so funny. <laughs> but yeah, so like this guy I had to see, like, what I was posting on my website and the work and just totally disregarded it. Um, now I'm going to talk about the police. <laughs> so again, um, I'm privileged. I grew up, I've had opportunities. I like, but also I'm black. So it doesn't mean my life is perfect or uh, easy. Um, so this summer, um, after George Floyd, um, I was on an editorial job for the New York Times um, to photograph the the PS refinery in South Philly on Passyunk Avenue. And actually, David helped me, but this but this photo um, I was alone. Um, so I was freaking out, nervous because it's a job. I, any job, always anxiety. <laughs> I can't, and I've learned to live with it. So it's like. You just got to learn to live with it. So I was try like trying to find every perspective I could of the refinery. And the New York Times really wanted to get uh, an image where you could see some residential areas next to it. But if you drive, if you've been there, if you drive around it, it's like really like it's hidden quite well. Um, so I had, a, I, I had the idea of taking a ladder being across the street, across the street from the refinery, there's this little park area with some houses like that in the shape of an L and then there's a park and then the refinery is right here. And so I was in front of the park in the bike lane with my ladder to see if I could like just get a different perspective, like just get taller and the cars, like it's a very busy road. There's a bunch of semis. So like I really hate timing cars. So like I wanted to get also wanted to get above the cars so I didn't have to time it where cars were not in my photograph. Mm -hmm. So I get I take a ladder, I park near someone's house, I see this guy, whatever, I'm allowed to do what I'm I'm allowed to work my job. So I take out my ladder, my camera, walk to the street, walk away from the residential areas and um photograph and this woman comes up, up to me asks me what I'm doing realizes I'm taking photos she says okay and then she walks to where my car was where the guy is and so I realize oh someone has like people are uncomfortable that I'm here with the ladder so I go talk to the guy and um, I tell him hi I was hired to photograph the refinery do you remember the day it was exploded or the day it exploded because when you work when you work for editorial jobs for you know, you also, like, you're not technically a journalist. Well, you are a journalist, but, like, so you have to follow journalistic ethics. So, like, I can't, um, I have to follow the law. I can't um, cause any controversy or whatever. Um, so I approached the guy and was like, hi, I'm, I'm a photographer. I just wanted to let you know I was hired to photograph the refinery. I understand having a ladder makes people could, you might be skeptical of me because I had a ladder. <laughs> and then I asked him about the day and he was very nice to me, talked about the day it exploded, how crazy it was, yada, yada, yada. I say, thank you. I get in my car and I leave. Um, and the 
and so like this guy's house was not, um he was on the edge of the road <coughs> excuse me um so as i left like his house is here this is the road and i i leave and i turn and so in my review mirror i can see the guy talking to the cops like kind of kind of like this shot and so like i expected him to tell me i expected him to tell the cops that i was okay unfortunately he did not completely racist blatantly racist the cops um, pull me over in my car and I get pulled over and it's and they don't believe me and they want proof of photo credentials and I keep telling them as I was on public property I'm allowed to photograph on public property because that's the law they can't I can't get in trouble if I'm on public property um, so they gave me a hard time they let me go there's more to the story because I was angry and I argued with them, but <laughs> they let me go. And then a month later, they show up at my apartment asking for photo credentials. So I just, I just have to say this because I never get the cops called on me. And just this time, I'm sure all of you are aware of everyone's on edge and the division and the um, just everything going on. <coughs> Sorry. Take a sip. All good. Yeah, and this was like right after. Um, this was after the George Floyd murder and um, after the the BLM uh, protests. And so, yeah, people. People were on edge. People are still on edge, but it's like, it's just, it sucks. And you are allowed to, like, you're allowed to photograph on public property. Like, even if you're, even if you're photograph, like, even if you're photographing a person, like, technically you're allowed to photograph them. Um, you know, <clears throat> don't really photo, you shouldn't photograph if they don't want you to photograph them. Like, I think it's, but it's, I mean, it's ultimately up to you to make that ethical call. But if you're just photographing, like, a building or a refinery, <laughs> Uh, like Hannah was, you know, that's totally, even if she wasn't working for the Times, it would be legal to do that. Yeah. <clears throat> and I just wanted to share my story because it's just absurd. <laughs> it's just really absurd. And the fact that they came to my house a month later um, when I was let go, and I still had to show proof of my photo credentials. So um if you work for people if you you know now i always get a letter of assignment to show proof um which is still absurd but um just just with current i mean just be careful be attentive um learn how to be attentive to to pay attention to your surroundings <clears throat> um l l read people you know um and definitely just be safe um, but I wanted to share that story because <clears throat> because I never personally had a, a experience with the cops at me directly until this. Um, but the reason why I made this next project called Curse by Night because <clears throat> um, as a young kid growing up in Fort Collins, just going to the convenience store like just just be I, I was always watched you know shopping for clothes i was followed you know uh, my brothers were always pulled over by the cops um <clears throat> and um and then just like uh, like in larger cities like other areas the black communities are harassed and um are purposely intimidated by the police um and then of course Trayvon Martin, all these, all these innocent people who have died in the hands of cops is the reason why I made this um, project called Curse by Night because um, um, my idea, my thought process behind it is that 
just because like people are so for those who see it in black and white who for those who um uh make their decisions and actions based off of what pers of because someone's skin color is black um I made this concept that black people are cursed, you know, specifically black men, just be, because of this perception, because of the, the media always having a negative, um, <clears throat> a negative uh, uh, image of black men, especially underprivileged black men. Um, there's, it, there's all, yeah, I don't know. Did my, you guys get it, right? <laughs> Um, so I, what I would do is <clears throat> I'd walk around. Oh, I should say I was, I got, I, this project I made at Yale. So after RIT, um, I moved to Philly and then, uh, three years, I, three years outside of, I waited three years to apply to grad school and then I got into Yale and then I made this project at Yale. <clears throat> Um, and my uh, thinking behind this is I would walk around at night in um, Brooklyn, uh, East New York, Brooklyn, Harlem, uh, Hartford, Connecticut, and Philly. I would walk around at night and find, um, so if you take this guy out, if you take the, port, the person out of this image and it's just the stoop, I would just walk around at night and look for backgrounds to look for scenes that looked like it could be in a horror movie, you know, like that it could be used to portray evil or like something bad is going to happen um, <clears throat> to darkness. So then I would find the scene and then I would just wait for a black person to walk by and then ask and put them in the scene and and tell them that I'm <clears throat> I'm a student at Yale. I have this project. It's a conceptual project. Um, I'm I use available light, so it's at night. So all my exposures were at least like twelve seconds long. So my subjects have to stay pretty still. They can't move. I have to communicate that, <clears throat> and that's just what I would do. So this these first few are like, they didn't make the cut on my website, but just to, just to give you more images to look at. And this is all film still, you're still shooting uh, medium format? Yeah, I prefer, I um, grew up learning film. So for my, for all my personal work, I shoot film. And um, for editorial assignments, I prefer to shoot film. Some people will pay for it. If they don't pay for it, I'll shoot digital. But um, prefer film is like my, and I still use the same camera since like, since the high schoolers, like I use a Mamiya RZ and now I use a Mamiya RB. So I'm, I've pretty much been using the same camera for over 10 years and, um, just get to know your lens, like, and um, try not to use zoom lenses, but get to know your lens. Like the more, like, the more you know, like the second you know how your lens is gonna like, how, like when you see it, when you wanna, when you see a photograph you wanna make, you want it to be like, just, you wanna know exactly what you want to do with your lens or where your lens is gonna be and then you we just move around and continue to discover different perspectives. To City Hall. Um, <clears throat> yeah, I just like for I don't know if other people get this, but I just really wanted like something skeletal, <laughs> but like definitely in the center of this photograph, my focus was the white man with the big white book. Um, this is a friend of a friend. 
Um, he he did that with his hands, and I it was his choice, so I just let him do it. <clears throat> this image <coughs> sorry I don't know why I'm like clapping <coughs> I went for a walk this morning and it was like it's cold right 30 degrees yeah, <laughs> yeah your um, this one's called King Solomon I met King Solomon when I was <clears throat> I was um, testing out my friend's handmade city cam. She made a city cam from, <coughs> sorry. <coughs> Let me just grab a cough drop, is that okay? Yeah, 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 please, please. I'll just, um... okay. oh, real quick. Yeah, yeah, go ahead. Yeah, so uh, I really like what Hannah was saying about uh, the camera, like the, so she's used that camera for 10 years and uh, being so, so familiar with your equipment can make you so adept and just able to just, when you see the photograph, just to grab it and not have to like fiddle with your controls and like be unsure of, um, you know, how to make the picture technically. And you know, that's not something that happens overnight, obviously, that happens with experience and it takes, it takes a lot of shooting and a lot of just, uh, you know, a lot of, a lot of making work to really have the camera be an extension of you. And once you're at that point, like, you know, you can make, you can make magic. Okay. All yeah. Good. All, <clears throat> All good. Cool. Um, so my friend, <laughs> Hannah Hummel, King Solomon is a filmmaker. And he, um, when I met him, he had lived in Brooklyn for 10 years, but originally is from Nigeria. So King Solomon saw me playing with this handmade steady cam. Also, you, you can make your own equipment with cheap, the cheap way. You don't have to buy everything, all the expensive stuff. So anyway, I was playing around with this handmade steady cam. He saw me. He pulled over and he's like, where'd you get that? And I was like, my friend made it. And he was like, he was like so interested in it as a filmmaker. And we got to talking, <clears throat> then he learned I was a photographer. We became friends and he, so he, I told him I was doing this project, walking around the city at night, photographing black men. And sometimes he would help me out. Sometimes he, he would just hang out with me when I was, look for scenes. And then eventually he invited me into his home and this is his home. Um, and this is also his home. So um, I asked him if I could take a photograph. He said, yes. So I brought a clamp light <clears throat> and he's just like, can you see my mouse? Okay, so like he's like standing, sitting right here on a chair and then I have a light, a clamp light, simple light you can get at Home Depot and I just, shined it to cast his shadow on the wall and then he had these like these leaves <clears throat> so i used the leaves to also just to create the claw-like structure or figure um and i got lucky because he was very helpful and very into it and he likes this photograph and we still talk <clears throat> um but he fell asleep <laughs> <laughs> which was perfect because it took me forever to get the claw right perfect so it was just like I just let him sleep and I just like spent like an hour just like taking so many pictures um and this is what I got and this is King Solomon <clears throat> I actually might might see him this weekend because I might go to New York but COVID, I don't know. 
car, that car light is always so good. Like I love the, the way light filters in and the way you mix the light sources here, like the, the green of the, I don't know, sodium vapor. Is that what makes that color? Like I'm not sure of the- I just, guess so. I don't know, just the, it's just so, um, the contrast of colors, like the way the light is on his face and then the, the, the background on the window, it's just like photographically, it's just uh, not to mention like the, the, you know, the beauty of the portrait itself, but just like the light does so much here. Yeah, we're waiting at a stoplight. So the red is coming from the red light. Um, yeah, and I guess that building has specific light. Sorry, I don't know. I don't know what you're asking. Just... <clears throat> I definitely like sat and stared at this composition and at this composition for an hour before taking it. And then I got lucky because um, in the middle of the exposure, this car drove off, so it's like kind of ghost like. <clears throat> this is a um, family friend. His name is um, Daryl Perkins. He lived in Hartford when I was at Yale. Um, that's his wife. They're married. Um, so I and I was I think I was watching Hitchcock at this time, but I just really wanted to make I wanted to make it look like he was protecting her. And so, um, <clears throat> and yeah, just like, like they're afraid of something, hiding from something. Um, and what is interesting, before I tell some people that, some people tell me that they, it looks like they're having an affair. So like, just that, like, <clears throat> I don't know, and I'm, yeah, so I, I mean, there's, you can't know everything about with the photograph, you know, definitely need, but that's what's lovely about photographs is that you can, your imagination, it allows your imagination to go places, especially when you're speaking conceptually, and then it's just like, well, why would I have that thought, you know, so it's just like, the purpose of this project is for people, like, I made this project for people that would like my friends, like <clears throat> at RIT, like we would go get ga get gas and they would see a bunch of black people outside the the gas station and then we're like, let's go to a different one. I would be like, why? Like, what's wrong? Like, does it make any sense? And then I would make my friend go in anyway and it would be fine, <laughs> you know, <laughs> like, and then like, or just walking down the street and there's a black man on the corner and other black friends would dash across the street because they didn't want to pass through a, a crowd of black men. And, you know, like, that's why I make these photographs because it's all about the perception about what, it, what your brain makes it seem like it looks like. So like, this is, this guy, like, I didn't ask permission for this guy, but just because he's like looking at something and, you know, like the woman's looking the same direction, you know, does it feel like, something's happening, you know, like, <clears throat> it's just what it looks like, you know, like, don't believe your brain is what, like, this project is, is for, for, for people who are afraid of Black people, don't believe your brain, that's what this project is, because, because it, this perception has hurt, taken people's lives. <clears throat> This one, I um, I was walking, I think this is in Crown Heights. Um, I saw someone walk past me and like walk under the light where he was, he is standing. <clears throat> so it was like a flash. So it was like, the person was dark, then it was like a flash and then it went dark. So I just sat, I waited, I think it was an hour also, I just waited for the perfect person for the image to walk by and I asked this young man, and I just really liked his jacket. <clears throat> um, yeah. And just like placed him there.
Yeah, I feel like it's so powerful this um, this use of like physical darkness to represent this like this cursedness, uh, this societal cultural curse um, on black men. It's just really um, again and again in these images. It's like, so powerful. Some of these I'm seeing for the first time, which is really cool. For me. Awesome, sweet. Yeah, it's just like <clears throat> only we, the people, can end this curse by not believing certain per perceptions. So again, kind of like me talking to the men who sexually her cat called me, like just talk to people and maybe you won't be afraid of them. <laughs> you know, like if you have this perception, where's the evidence? Has it has it's never happened to you? Like evidence of you personally experience. <clears throat> And there's a long history of why, um, why this perception is on the black community, you know, like the KKK is still in the police force, you know, like, um, <clears throat> so this, it, um, are two friends that I made during this project that also helped me with the project while I was shooting it, we became friends. They live in Atlanta now, so it's still hard to keep contact. Every now and then we'll text each other. Um, their name are Steven and Brendan, so they're brothers, and I really just wanted to, um, Brendan is this figure here. I'm kind of looking over his shadow, or his shoulder, <clears throat> and then that's Steven. And this is them together, they're brothers, um, and I, um, they helped me out a lot while I was at Yale. Like this is a this is my favorite um, short film. It's kind of like an experimental documentary. It's on my website called Blueprint, um, and it also has to deal with these themes of um, black men being harassed by the cops. And then I juxtapose it with Chills and Steven because they <clears throat> at the time. <clears throat> at the time were um, emerging musicians. So I interviewed them. This image um, represents me um, because um, I have two brothers, but my younger brother, we're a year apart and we have the same exact background. We have the same parents, but the way um, <clears throat> his life society's views on him and um his his he's we have the same background came from the same place same oppor opportunities in high school but once he turned 14 like society was very brutal to him um <clears throat> i'm not gonna tell his story because he doesn't want me to but like um but the purpose of this image is like we we're siblings, we have the same background, same parents, same high school education. Um, but I went to Yale and he ended up in prison. So like that just, you know, like this is the world we live in. And um, now he's not in prison, but like he's, and he's about to, um, he's a senior in college. He's about to graduate and he's a great person never deserved to go to prison, but just the, just how our lives went completely different directions because of people constantly bringing him, putting him down, holding him down. <clears throat> so again, like my brother and I have the same background, but I'm more pri privileged because I've had more opportunities and people accept me more because I'm a woman. And so this image is like, yeah, I'm not gonna explain it, but I did, um, <clears throat> this is an example of carry, carry your camera with you everywhere you go, cause you never know. <laughs> so this like, if I did not have this, my camera with me, this image would not exist. So like while I was photographing at night, and let me know if I'm going over. Am I going over? 
No, I mean, um, we we have until eleven thirty, but so okay. But th you can decide how long you want to go. But I I just I do want to have time for questions if there are any um, at the end. Okay, so like um, going uh, oh, cool. we have plenty of time. Yeah. Cool. <clears throat> um. So. Brooklyn, New York City, it's impossible to find a parking spot. <laughs> so, especially after midnight. So, I frequently parked illegally and I got towed three times <clears throat> during this project. Um, and one of the times, my oil tank got damaged. So, and the repair was like over 600 bucks. So, I went to the, and being a, a college student, of course, I didn't have any money. So, like, I, um, I went to New York City, this city building, to file a claim um, to try and get my money back. Um, and then, of course, I looked out the window, and there it is. You know, like the, I didn't have to do anything. I only had three frames left in my on my roll of film. So, like, this is carry your camera with you. <laughs> well, I did have to time it, but like, and frame it, but like, you know. Sometimes as photographers, we are gifted these moments and, but you have, you still have to be there and know, know that the moment is happening to make it happen. Um, <clears throat> and then 2018, this is my project after grad school. It's called Semaphore. Um, and Semaphore are like pretty much like two flags. Um, they're usually white. They're used to like com communicate to like boats docking, you know. Um, so like you have two flags and one in each hand and certain positions mean, um, certain positions mean has a, is the letter of the alphabet or a number. So you have to spell, when you communicate you spell and that's how people from afar know what you're saying. So my idea behind, my concept behind Semaphore is I, I, at this time, I didn't want to talk specifically about race, but just about identity in general. And I wanted to talk about how, um, and I wanted to use photography, which is all about the surface, it's two dimensional, um, it's just an image. Um, I just wanted to talk about our identity, how like just looking at me, you don't know who I am unless I tell you. So like, um, this is about how everyone, every single person literally has to spell out their identity to people, no matter who you are and no matter what you look like. And for some people, you know, it's, um, you know, like, You know, for family, sometimes I felt like certain family members didn't know who I was until, you know, I turned 30. So it's just like life is, life is um, communicative. <laughs> so. Um, and then my thought behind this is like, this was taken in 2013 while I was at Yale, but I didn't use it for any of my, I, didn't use it until semaphore. This is my dad, and that's actually my backyard in Fort Collins, Colorado, or old backyard, not anymore. Um, and um, just the fact that he's standing back in the shade, just watching, you know, like I kind of like, I kind of see him as a judgment. <laughs> Um, and then this is my, these are my sister's feet. She ha she's diabetic. So like your feet and your limbs are really important. Um, and um, my dad is very critical. He, um, he's not affectionate. Um, so he would give her a hard time about taking care of her feet. Um, so I just really wanted to photograph them. And then this is the tree, just like, um, just going like, uh, what's the word? 
gravitating to the darkness, to the shade. <laughs> And I, I just love that this grave is alone and caving in on itself. Um, this was a former CCP student. She, um, I got lucky. I found this light, this area for the lighting. I remember driving somewhere and I was like, wow, the light in, at this at this specific time in this place is beautiful. And so, and I always wanted to photograph her. So I asked her if I could photograph her and we, we meet here and I got lucky again. She had just been proposed to <laughs> and she, and she doesn't like, she doesn't um, know if she wants to marry the guy. So like, she was just in her own head and like, you know, so it's just, you know, just waited, positioned her and then just waited for her to go back to thinking of if she wanted to marry this guy. Um, this is Inez. I uh, put an ad on Craigslist. Um, I was like female photographer looking for female to photograph in bathing suit on beach because I had the specific idea. Um, but this idea is like the advertisement, how in society makes, a, how society um, uses the surface to for identity, you know, like um, fashion, um, you know, just imagery in general. Um, so this is like the advertising. This is Inez. There's two parts to this image. So this is Inez. This is like the advertising shot, but like, um, so this is what I, this is just what I'm thinking behind it. And then this is Inez fixated, fixated on her beauty or the idea of beauty, that beauty is Physic as a physical trait, and we all know it's an inner trait, you know. And there's many aspects of beauty, but um, the most popular idea of beauty is the surface and the female. So I wanted to um, comment on that idea, and so Inez is possessed by this idea, um, and just incorporating death. <laughs> sort of, I don't know, <laughs> trying. And I should say, um, just for visual literacy, you know, like originally I, my plan, and Inez was told all about it and I did make the photograph because I told, I told her my ideas and the reason why I wanted to make this. She was cool about it. And originally I wanted her to vomit on herself. So I made this handmade, vomit with oatmeal, edible food. And um, we made a photograph of her like, just like in the kind of in the same, same composition, but just like a little bit further pulled back. But then just looking at the image, like I couldn't stop thinking about bulimia. And so like, since I was thinking about it, I was like other people could take this image out of context. So I went with the, I was like, Roll your eyes back and look possessed. <laughs> so this came out better. Uh, this is Kayla and Zane. Uh, originally, I was going to put her of Kayla in the bathing suit, suit too, but then she told me she had a son, and that, and she agreed for me to photograph them together. And I spent about an hour with them. This was the last location I took them, and. Um, Zane, he naturally fell into this pose because he was watching grown men pay, play soccer. So again, just like lucky. And then just working quickly, knowing my lens, knowing where I wanted to place the lens and just already knowing the exposure and just taking it before, before I lose the gesture. So like the whiteness is kind of the semaphore reference. Like I tried to, yeah. This is an old neighbor. Uh, 
um, this is like Oxford in like 21st maybe. And literally after this photograph, the tow, tow truck showed up. Says so Simon. Um, so I, uh, my main income is a equipment manager at CCP. And so I frequently, well, before the pandemic, would eat lunch at Whole Foods. And I met Simon at Whole Foods. Just loved his hair, his figure, everything, everything about him. And he's actually a photographer himself. And we use the same exact camera. Um, and yeah, well, allowed me to take his portrait. He lives in New York now. Oh, I guess that's all. Or I have um, my Magnum application. Yeah, did you wanna, um, I don't know how much, is it, is it, uh, how much long, is it short? Is it how, is it's it something? 50, it's 50 images. It, we could just do it in the background and talk or, or I don't have to do it at all. Uh, I'd, I'd love to see it. I think, yeah, why wh don't you put it up and then we can, we can also talk and maybe, yeah, maybe you can say, cause some of them are images we've seen already, right? So maybe, okay. Yeah. So yeah, Hannah, like maybe you could talk a little bit about the um, the process of, you know, being nominated for Magnum and um, yeah. Yeah, so um, I was asked to apply. Um, so yeah, I took, took advantage of the opportunity. I was never considered myself Magnum material or, you know, like, just never considered Magnum for myself. Um, but they asked me to apply um, because like everyone else, try, um, they're trying to add more diversity to their institution, but they definitely um, made sure to tell me that I was chosen for my talent and for my work, you know, not just because I'm black. <laughs> like, so, and and they typically, um, typically photojournalists are usually become members um, and they want to add more diverse diversity image wise too. Um, so they, they're adding more people who have a, um, a fine art and a documentary aspect to their work. So, oops. Okay, yeah, so, um, my approach to the application was to start strong and end strong. It was, I, I got advice and that's what they told me. So I combined semaphore and curse by night to like almost sequential, sequentially make it feel like I'm telling a narrative. You know, you want the images to work together to speak to each other. Yeah, maybe we could, um, let, why don't we open it up? Does anybody have questions for Hannah? You know, either about the, uh, the image making process, specific images, um, you know, I think no, no, no topic is off the table if, if, if Hannah agrees with that. Yeah, definitely. Ask me anything. And then I also could show just like a small clip of what I'm working on now, if you guys want. It's a video. Yeah, can I get some head nods in the, in the chat? Yeah, we wanna see the video. We have questions. I think people want to see the video. Okay. So 
before I move on, there's some um, images from editorial work that I included yeah. in the application. Sorry. Yeah, I, we, I, uh, I haven't seen these. These are from, each one is from a different magazine. Yeah, so the new ones that like this bust is from the New York Times Magazine. Um, uh, this port, the pop-up magazine is on the left. On the left here is New York Times Magazine. And I this, love that, that spilled milk picture. It's just, it's like the classic, like drinking milk in, in school, right? You have these yeah. shitty little milk boxes. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Um, and yeah, that was from Resemblance from um, exploring or uh, walking, photographing high school students. And the story, the editorial piece for this portrait, it was about how this family was already struggling before the pandemic job wise, and then how the pandemic impacted their family. Uh, this was for the New Yorker. Uh, Brent Legs here on the left. He um, he's a. I can, sorry. It's always hard for me to say this word. Preservationist. Preservationist. Um, so he specifically looks for, for African American historical structures to preserve them, to keep um, um, to keep them from uh, eroding and going damaged and making them historical structures. So the cottage on the right, that's the Winfrey Cottage. Um, it was in Richmond, Virginia. Right now, it's right next to the slave jail and um, what, what used to, where the slave jail used to um, be located. And there's a grave there um, where a bunch of slaves were buried. It was very, I, very like ghost-like vibes, <laughs> I have to tell you. But um, Winfrey Cottage, um, she was one of the first to own her own home and be free and she would um you know like help a lot of slaves and and whatnot and then this is city of brotherly love you guys already saw this so awesome sorry. i have to turn on my drive no it's problem. gonna be a second before the video comes up. No problem. Yeah. Does anybody have any questions, anything at all, or any comments, any any pictures they especially liked? Um, I had a question. Thank you so much, Hannah, for um, talking with us today. Um, I just had a question. So, how has like the pandemic influenced your concepts um, with photographs? Or I know that you take a lot of portraits. So, how has that um, impacted um, what you photograph now? Um, I'm still photographing the same things pretty much, or, um, it's, it's made me more emotional and more passionate. So, um, yeah, I, I feel more like an activist, but like the personal work that I'm doing now, um, uh, for a second, I, I don't know if you guys know of the NFAC, they're a black militia, but they're not their outlook is to p protect other black people. They don't want to overthrow the government or anything like that. So it's just like an accent. Like, so I went to photograph them, but those portraits aren't very accessible because they um, keep their identity secret. So like those portraits aren't as emotional and as um, personal or like genuine as my other portraits. Um, and I've been making video. So like, I guess the pandemic has just made me more of an activist um, and more um, passionate. And and then Magnum, of course, is like, all right, you gotta get in shape and you gotta keep, uh, just make work to prove yourself. So I'm shooting a lot more than I used to before the pandemic and the pandemic, George Floyd, the godsend of George Floyd, it's absolutely horrible that it had to happen to him, that it did happen to him. Um, and for this, for, and now all of a sudden I'm like 
I get Magnum. I have, I'm working all the time. I have a bunch of freelance. Um, now, now society is actively making their spaces more diverse. So I've been working a lot more. The pandemic has been good to me. Um, unfor not unfortunately, but like <laughs> compared to everyone else, um, it's been good to me. So I'm grateful and thankful, but also pissed, but, and still like want to make work about <laughs> like all the issues going on. And I think I'm like, sp I'm leaning into talking about Philadelphia cops specifically. So like, I'm like, I'm just like, I'm ready to just like, you know, call out the cops. Um, someone else had a question. Sayer, yeah. Hi, um, I really like all the photographs and I think they're really amazing. I also like the, um, the subject matter that you talked about assumption because when I was still a teenager, when I was 17, I had my own experience with assumption. So I could like definitely like relate to that. And I just, I loved all the work. It was really amazing. Awesome, thank you. You're welcome. Okay, sorry, my, I'm just gonna like the, so I, so I'm paying attention to the NFAC, but they're kind, they were kicked off of social media, so it's kind of hard to follow them, and the NFAC, they're all across the United States, so like, and they're getting more and more private, so, and you have to be ex-military to be a member of the NFAC, so that's not me and um and they already have their own photographer so um yeah i had i can't get inside nfac so i'm still watching them to see if they plan a formation or um right now they're protecting um i'm sure you guys saw um the girl in louisville kentucky how she just shut city council down in that um what is it called crap anyway so she like after her talking to the cops and expressing herself about the cops and what they do in her community the cops started to follow her so she hired the nfac to protect her from just because she felt uncomfortable being followed um so I'm still paying attention to them and just waiting to see when, if they make an announcement and if I can just like quickly go to where they are and make work. But um, in the meantime, I'm focusing on Philadelphia. And so after Walter Wallace Jr., uh, not Monday night, I was like, once I found, once I heard the news, I was like disappointed devastated and I could not I would like thought about going out and protesting but like for myself my physical mental state like my mental state I couldn't handle it and I decided not to go out but I went out the Tuesday the night before or the night after and it the protest was still pretty intense so this is footage of me um at the protest um there's much it's 30 minutes so i'm not going to show you the whole thing i'm just going to show you the very last clip because this last clip is um why i want to continue this and why i want to really target the police pretty much <laughs> um because <clears throat> i think it's inappropriate of what how they handled this Sorry, is that too loud? Same color as mine. Same color as I don't know. I don't. I don't know if it. Uh, if your volume affects our volume, I actually don't know. It, it sounds fine. Uh, it sounds fine on my end. Okay, so this guy in the white, um, he's uh, the deputy commissioner for the police department. He's not the main commissioner, um, but he's one of them. Oops. 
Sorry, I'm like, I think it's. So pretty much like this last scene that that um, young man, he's 17. He's 17. <laughs> and that pisses me off because um, where everyone's at the protest, there's that wall of cops with their riot gear. Um, and it's it's peaceful. You know, of course, people are voicing their opinion. You know, F the police, you know, people are angry and have a right to be angry. Um, but what I did not appreciate is how that commissioner um, went and talked to that young man who's 17, a minor, um, specifically to ask him how he could help. And I, and I, and then later on, like you can hear, I can't contain myself because I'm so angry, you know, like um, you like forget, like for, I'm just like, forget the ethics of documentary. This like, this is my experience too. I'm going to talk, you know, I felt the need to talk, you know, like, um, so I voiced my opinion and to the commissioner and, um, and then once I found out that student was 17, I told the cop, I was like, this is inappropriate. He's a minor. We're at a protest. and you're, He just got off parole that day. And I was just like, you know, like he, if, if he, like, I was, he was more in control than I was, you know, like, so if he, if we switched places, the cops could like, if, you know, and then there's a moment where he goes to, he starts touching the young man and I start yelling at him to stop touching him. Um, sorry, it, I could have showed it, but I'm just going to tell you. But um, yeah, so I thought like, I'm, and I, the police commissioner now, ha I have a potential meeting with him, whatever, but like, so I don't know. I'm just like very um, worked up and this is what I'm working on. <laughs> and like, this, is, this is what I want to focus on. Um, just trying to get into the community and like um, this is, this clip is this, hopefully you'll see it in the next month or so because I'm, I want to get it out there soon. But just that moment where he, the police are asking a 17 year old how they can help him and um, is very inappropriate. So you guys, I'm sure you guys don't know what you want to do with your life. I, at 29, I was still figuring out what I wanted to do with my life. Um, so it was, in my opinion, highly inappropriate for him to ask a 17 year old what he, how he could help him. And so I interrupted and I was like, he needs an adult present to talk to you. You should like, you know, the answers to these questions, you know, it's deeper than just not just being bored um poverty education black communities are specifically targeted um, um and intimidated 
you know, so like I like, um, you know, like that scene is for me, it was pretty dynamic of how they approach this young man. And then um, all these people are voicing their opinions and they know and they're, I want to say pretending that they're trying to talk with us and um, ask us how they could help us when they know the answers to these questions, you know, they know the answer. So it's just like that, that was really frustrating. So that's, I'm just going to focus right now. I think I'm, I'm going to try my best I can. And especially now that I'm like in the police system, there's a report on me for being suspicious, you know, like because I had a camera. After the cops, when the cops came to my house, they said there was a port on me. Um, but like, so now, like, this is, yeah, so this is what I'm working on. It's, I just want to show people that it's deeper than what they think it looks like and what they think, um, what social media, what the internet tells you. So, like, I want to, I want to get in, um, but it gets complicated because now I plan on getting interviews of people and their experiences with the cops, but that could get them in trouble. So I have to figure out how um, how to make it anonymous and still and still feel um, impactful, you know, and tell people's stories. So. Wow. Well, thank you so much. Um, for I think I speak for everyone when this this incredibly beautiful and generous uh, talk you've given. And so please join me in thanking Hannah. <laughs> for coming and talking to us today yeah so um great um yeah do you have any uh do you have any, i'm gonna do what uh greg does do you have any advice for young uh young photographers and artists out there yeah just stay true to yourself recognize when you're trying to please people and don't do things just to please people great I think that's great advice. Yeah, so um, I'm gonna, I can run this by you before uh, I put it on. I was thinking of, I'm gonna post this lecture to um, the Moodle page so uh, you all can see it and the students who are absent today can see it and I can I can give you, uh, I can let you see it first, Hannah, if you'd like and- um, You don't need to, I'm, I'm fine. Okay, you well, all right. Well, thank you everyone. Unless there are any last questions for Hannah or um, oh, maybe um, if students want to get in touch with you, would that be something you'd be open to? Yeah, the, like you can email me for sure. Um, um, just keep in mind that I'm kind of busy. So if I don't reply right away, just don't take it personally. Um, but I will definitely reply when I can. <laughs> yeah, and uh, you know, uh, I don't think you're too big of an Instagrammer, but you do have an Instagram. And yeah. Yeah, I can I can share Hannah's email address or is is it on your website also? I uh, it's not on my website. So it's pretty much Hannah Price underscore photo video is my Instagram. Okay, cool. Yeah. So that would be a good way to get in touch with you, just DMing you. Yeah, yeah. Okay, awesome. And I'll it's I definitely respond faster to DMs because it feels like text than email. Like feels so formal. I'm pretty behind in email. Like I'm kind of like two weeks behind in email. <laughs> well, I don't think anyone will begrudge you for. <laughs> I know you're busy. It's a busy time, and it's a it's unprecedented times in a lot of ways, especially with the new shutdown. And um, yeah, but thank you so much for for doing this. And uh, I have one one more word of encouragement. Yeah, please. Um, just in my experience, you know. Um, I deal with a lot and you can, you don't have to show me the video, but you can cut this or keep it if you want. I don't care. <laughs> so like, I deal with a lot of um, authority or uh, white men specifically. Um, so don't, and they make it seem like uh, our generation is sensitive. Um, and I, there was one comment to me specifically of how these days, social media, everyone is on anxiety pills now because of social media and people today are just overly sensitive. Um, but that's not, that's not what it is. In my perspective, people today are just not afraid to speak up. 
So don't be afraid to speak up. Don't be afraid to share your opinions. Um, definitely respect people, um, but um, don't let people limit you. Um, so just like within this, this time, you know, like speaking up and voicing yourself is more important than pleasing people um, because that's, um, yeah. So that I just want to say that and I felt like there was something else I wanted to say, but I'm forgetting, <laughs> but. I can always pass it along to them. Yeah, so just don't, don't let people intimidate you. Stay true to yourself and be a good person. Speak out for other people when you see, hear something, but don't um, attack them like in a respectful way that how, treat people how you want to be treated. So if, if I, if my friend were to call me out, like I want my friends to call me out, you know, cause they, you know, I trust them. So like in the way they approach me, I appreciate it. So, but if it's a stranger or someone you work with, just be attentive to the situation and read people and be respectful as you can, but always speak up against bad people. <laughs> Awesome. I think that's a great uh, place to leave it. Um, yeah. Uh, so my class, you know, you're all work, your final projects, you should be well on your way. Um, you should be shooting. Um, yeah, it's coming up faster than, than faster than you know it. And uh, yeah, so enjoy the rest of your day, your days. And uh, thank you again, Hannah. Uh, this was amazing. Um, yeah. All right. Thank you. Um... Take care. Be well. Stay well. Be safe.